When you guys are looking for a new project, what kind of sparks your interest? I think inspiration can come from anywhere with a lot of these projects. I think it's about characters, mainly for me, because without those personalities and without the honesty that they they want to give you, yeah. um, you're just not going to deliver the level of film that we're trying to put out there. Which leads us nicely into the <laughs> Bros documentary, which is I mean, unbelievable viewing for a star. It also went huge. Did you expect it to go that big when you were making it? Well, yes and no. You sort of, you know what you're making, but the mm. whole way through you never know how it's going to be received. It was released out in the cinemas, but it didn't really sort of catch. And then when the BBC put it out, that's when it sort of started to go and it grew and grew and grew. And that was an amazing thing to see because at one point we feared that only the fans of the band were going to see it. And we always wanted it to be a standalone piece that everyone could see and enjoy. I think it always had that kind of cult fil yeah. film feel to it. And I think um, we used to laugh and cry and have so much fun in the edit that it felt like if people don't get to see this, it'll be a real shame. What was the day to day like when you were making this? I mean, pre, <laughs> pre edit. I need to know, like what, um, were you both there all the time filming with them or would one of you just go? And how much, I've got so many questions, but how can you even begin to make a documentary like this and because you can't really script it. These kind of films are about embedding yourselves. We have to become part of these people's lives, otherwise they're and not they going to be that honest. And they need to trust you as well. Exactly, yeah, so we're, we're there every second of every day with them in the evenings, we're having dinner with them. We're there with them the whole time because if you, if you didn't give up your life for this film, if you didn't get, give up your life to get to become best friends with them, counsellors, brothers, wh whatever we became, um, we just, it just wouldn't have been the film that it was and they wouldn't have trusted us and it, yeah, it wouldn't have been ultimately what we delivered. One of the things we like to do as opposed to some of the American style crews is keep it small because then it's intimate. Then you can have those, those relationships with them. Whereas, whereas four got cameras, four cameras and ten soundies, people, yeah. they feel like they're on a film set. Whereas we always try and run it differently so that they know the individuals, where we're at. You know, when we walk in in the morning, they'll know what mood we're in because we've spent so much time with them. We know what mood they're in and we know what we can go with this. Was it the film that you guys set out to make? Is that the film that we saw? Yeah, pretty much. I would say in, in not absolute, but yes. Did you intend for it to be as... Absolutely. Um, Ridiculous Whatever you're saying, yeah. and as funny and yeah. as, as crazy yeah. as it Absolutely. was. Absolutely, these are the pe these are the people we were dealing with, and yeah. if we're not getting deep with these people, if you're not connecting with people, all you get is the surface fluff of PR. Matt is a hilarious person. Luke is a very funny, caring person as yeah. well. That yeah. needed to come across on camera, and I think we delivered that at the same time as not taking the piss, which was a very important thing that yeah. we, we I was going to say that there is a really fine line between making a documentary like this and it's slipping into. Mockumentary. Well, that was something we were really conscious of because I mean, look, part of who they are now is because of how they were treated 30 years ago and, yeah. you know, by the press. And that's part of why they gave us so much because they felt like they had a point to prove back to the UK and to, to the wider audience. And we were really conscious of the fact that we couldn't slip back into just taking the mickey out of them and just putting all of the funny bits in because there were plenty more of, you know, sh uh, of parts where they show their sort of over the top um, characters. And there was one particular moment where Joe, myself and the editor, Will, came together after an incident while filming um, and just said to each other, we've got to make a sort of balanced film here where we're not just slipping into just t showing the funny side. And there's and no way, a, yeah. Yeah. a key moment for it, wasn't it? And there's it? no way you come away at the end of this film laughing at these people. You've laughed with them no, and then true. you're in love yeah. with them because they got on stage, they're brothers yeah. finally, they're back together and that was what we were trying to achieve. Yeah. Yes, the start of the film's funny. Yes, there's loads of amazing one-liners in the film but ultimately the heart at the core of the film and the brotherly love is what, is what people enjoy about this yeah. film. Do you think they were wary of, of you guys, especially at the start or do you think, no. No, really? not at all. We, they trusted us implicitly. Because for, ex for example, if somebody took me um, you know, to the sea and they said, just, just sit and look at it, just gaze at the sea and we're just gonna get some <laughs> shots. I, as someone who works in telly and media, would go, guys, what? This oh, is a on. bit... Yeah, but, but also, but Luke does. <laughs> I mean, he works in film. This is a, so he's very conscious of, you know, where this Because those bits were be. quite funny. Yeah, but he's also that... Per I can't stress enough that these are the people. <laughs> yeah. These aren't constructed moments. Like, th that is a moment with Luke, as in, yeah. maybe I'll go down to the beach. You, you don't see him hike So up. you followed him down Absolutely. to the beach. Absolutely. And, like, the top of the hill. The top of the hill What do you do on your time off? He goes, well, I go hiking. Brilliant. Go hiking. hiking. We have a topic that we want to speak to you at the top of the hill, but <laughs> but let's go hiking. Let's see you. And then at the top, let's just have a moment. He goes, well, what do you normally do? I meditate. Well, go on then. Perfect. So we sat on the top of the hill meditating. We're like, uh, no, tell us what you're thinking. Us.
And again, well, it goes back to that point of like us guiding the film and letting them be themselves. It's always a collaboration, isn't it? Um, you know, we've touched on there are some very funny moments. There's also some tricky moments. Yeah. And like you said, you're dealing with two brothers. There's a, a lot of history there. It's also incredibly uncomfortable yeah. to sit and watch two family members yeah. scream yeah. at each other. And there's actually in those moments, pure hate there. Yeah. How, um, how did you they're, they're film those and how did you they're feel They're incredibly about painful. It? I mean, it's that thing of being embedded, but it was more just focus on what's going on. We'll chat about it afterwards. You know, if we need to calm this down at some point afterwards, we'll have to calm it down, whatever we have to do. But you know, these things are building towards that. Um, and, you know, we're filmmakers. You need to have it out because if you don't have it out, well, everything's unsaid and everything's gone unsaid for 20 years, 30 years mm. with them. So if anything, our yeah. obligation in the film was to make them have it out and make sure that they were going to get to the stage because without, I think without us, it would have been a real struggle. Oh, definitely, mm. definitely. And they say it was like therapy to them and they're closer now than they ever have been. In terms of your careers, what advice would you kind of go back and give yourself, you know, when you were 28, just about to start out in this whole kind of telly thing? All the times you messed up. <laughs> yeah, no, just enjoy it all. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. I guess the big one is just shoot everything. Everyone's got a camera in their pocket. Like literally just keep shooting. You, you know, you're going you're gonna to kind of get there. And that feels like something that I kind of did for a long time. I need to know as well, do you still speak to Matt and Luke? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah quite. Howls? Well. Of course. You haven't yeah. fallen out? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Matt and Luke fall out. I started, I used to be in music. So I was a recording artist back in the early 90s. And we were going to do like a first video ever for that. And I had all sorts of high ambitions on who I wanted to do that. And then my record company boss said, hey, you have two grand, figure it out. So I realized I had to do it myself. <clears throat> but it wasn't, you know, utterly out of the blue because I, I've done, you know, I come from photography, I've done a lot of other things. And I, and I figured slightly foolishly that I could, but, but I got into it there and um, Weirdly enough, instantaneously, literally fell in love with it. And I've been doing music for a long time, and pretty much on that shoot day, I realized that this is what I want to do. So I continued making videos for myself, and then friends were asking, and then friends of friends, and then more and more, I, I enjoyed that, and that kind of replaced, it didn't replace my love for music, but it replaced another some other needs and urges. So I, I decided actually, literally, to, to leave music behind and, and continue with directing. A script was lying on my desk one day, uh, as they do. There's a lot of scripts in the, in the world of, of filmmaking, and the thing is that most of them are not very good. Uh, but it, you know, just by the title, I got very intrigued uh, because I knew that would be something that interests me. I like stuff that is that it's that it has darkness and a certain hopelessness and aspects of even nihilism in it and that got me interested but then also I'm old enough to 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 vividly remember when it happened um, so there was already sort of a narrative for me to sort of hook on to um, so I just jumped over the script and like with all these things it starts with the script and the script was very very good I had just come back from a very similar type of limited series in Eastern Europe, I, actually longer. Um, so it was a bit of a conflict between me and I have a very large family to sort of even allow myself to be interested in something with all the ramifications it has uh, in my life. You know, th that's the, the downside with filmmaking is that it always involves a lot of travel and long travels and all that. Uh, Fortunately enough, our, our kids are small enough to still be mobile. And uh, my wife and I spoke, spoke, spoke about it, and, uh, and then we realized we just had to do it. I mean, doing, doing these kind of projects involve a lot of different stages of it. What was very interesting for me, this is the first time I've ever done something that is based on facts. You know, very much, you know, telling a real story. And coming into this, where I ca came from, sort of a fiction lover on a lot of levels, I felt that, like let the um, let the drama sort of govern the situation here. Um, and first time upon reading the script, I was talking to Craig, the writer, and I said, "Oh, this is great. So how much of this is true?" And he said, 
everything. Right there, my mind was blown because obviously my my knowledge about the Ch Chernobyl catastrophe was limited to what everybody else knew. But you know, upon reading this script, you understand that it's just a fraction of the magnitude and the tragedy and the in this incredible event on so many levels. So from going from being a fiction person who wouldn't give a fuck about whether something was true or not. I've now become the opposite. I'm I'm only interested in real, true things. And upon embarking on this, I started reading everything I could ever come over. Uh, Craig had already done a lot of research and actually sort of made a good um, sort of file of stuff that one could look into. So it was a good start. There was a lot of books to read and a lot of films to watch and so on. And then I just continued. I, I couldn't stop. I was so immersed in it and so interested in everything. You know, it becomes more and more personal. You want to read an individual stories. You want to sort of feel what they felt and so on. So I, I, I think I've read everything that there is on the subject, including some quite boring sort of nuclear engineering stuff, but I just had to understand everything. I always feel pressure in doing anything for myself. Uh, the whole, one of the main things in many art forms is to make it as difficult as you possibly can for yourself, you know, and to not take any easy routes and, and not sort of follow some path of least resistance, rather the opposite. The only pressure I ever feel is for myself. Uh, and, uh, you know, it became, for me about you know the truthfulness of course but also sort of the the sort of the individual emotional authenticity of it you know you want it to feel experiential and real rather than as a fictionized or a drama even if it's based on real events for me it's about making it as experiential as ever possible so that you rather than watching it through normal filters of film and drama and that's why i also got increasingly interested in it it's more about Feeling the realness and feeling the authenticity of, of, of the of the of the people we meet, the situations, and all of that. So, so it was very much about finding a path down something very difficult. Try to avoid all you know. Try to avoid you know desperately avoiding any tropes or anything that is sort of. There's a lot of filmmaking in which the references are from films, you know. But I'm not like that at all, and I don't like that. So so it's so there's this sort of constant. Uh, sort of movement towards referring to reality rather than to the world of films in, in, in everything. Again, I st sort of started out in photography, so for me the image is, is very important, not necessarily from an aesthetical point of view, but for, f from how the image makes you feel. And, and uh, I mean, I guess it's just personal taste that I very much like, sort of a, some, some type of raw authenticity, but, but still with a photographic quality to it, I like the image adding a layer of emotions to it, how, how, how this image is made and how we do that. And, and then it becomes into sort of film school stuff which deals with who, who, what is the eye, who's, who's watching and how do we enhance the sense of us participating in this rather than looking at, at it from the outside, but whilst also making beautiful images. So, uh, it's for me, that aspect of filmmaking is something I'm very comfortable with based on where I kind of come from. And I, and I, uh, th that's not something that, that, that particular bit comes very natural to me. And uh, I, I uh, there's very few questions from me. It's just instinctively, I know exactly what I want there. Um, and then I had the, uh, the, the pleasure and the privilege to work with a Swedish DOP that I've that we both have tried to work with each other for many, many years and it never worked out. And then just by some very strange serendipity, it worked out this time. And not only did it work out, it was a, a phenomenal partnership in terms of sensibilities and uh, sort of this sort of Scandinavian, I don't want to say austerity, but there is a, there is a minimalism to some extent in how, how, the, how, how we deal with the photographic language. Yeah, it's a massive question. I'll just take one advice out of many. But I think it, it has to do with idiosyncrasity, you know, to, 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 as a director, as any form of artist, whether you write music or write books or poetry or making film, you have to have a voice that is singularly your own because there is no such thing as an arbitrary quality as a director or, or, or as any artist. Even if you're young enough to not trust your own uh, personal choices, because when you're younger, you tend not to. 
that's maybe the most important thing ever because whenever I meet students or I meet young filmmakers, the only thing that interests me is a unique voice. Uh, everything else can be taught, you know, and and what you want is that you know from the onset that you that you allow yourself to be free enough to 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 dig where you stand and to use your own references and experiences and and you know trust in the way something makes you feel and not about like oh this is, people are probably going to like this but sort of just go down to your own feelings and be brave and very bold and all of that and take massive massive risks that's that's the only thing i mean that's one of about a million pieces of advice i can give but that that one is pretty good one i think so you've actually had um, a strong focus on writing yes it started when i was at cambridge and then when i was at cambridge i didn't get a job with the television companies but I got into I went to the Royal Court Theatre well the Royal Court was a writers theatre and when I eventually started working at the BBC a lot it was a writers medium mm -hmm. and then in terms of the names you've worked with at the BBC Alan Bennett Tom Stoppard Stephen Polyakov quite an amazing list there what did your early experiences actually teach you about the craft of directing well particularly Alan was such a brilliant writer I mean and such a clever man what he wrote was so funny and so economical and so observant that you just had to pull your socks up. So would you say that when you do take on a project the, the writing and the script is kind yes. of the most yeah. important thing to yeah. you? Yes, absolutely. If you don't get the script right, you won't make a good film. So once you have, you have decided on the script, talk us through the stages of your involvement with, with that project. I mean, Well, then what you start to break it down and you break it down in your head and I tend to do that by casting people you know you think well shall I cast that actor well if it's that actor it'll be this if it's like that actor it'll be that so you start to pull it all to pieces and then re re reassembling it so what was it um, that drew you to a very English scandal oh, it was just wonderful it was I mean it, it was, an idiot would have done it I mean perhaps <laughs> I am an idiot it wasn't a very difficult decision First of all, the story that John Preston told in his book was very, very good and very funny and got the tone right. I remember talking to Richard Ingrams, who edited Private Eye in his time, and he said, oh, that's the one that gets the tone right. So I knew where I was. And then in terms of kind of drawing out these incredible performances by, by the actors, Ben Whishaw and Hugh Grant, they're both obviously nominated for BAFTAs. Well, you, you hire them. <laughs> you get good actors. Hugh is like Marlon Brando, he's a method actor. He comes very, very well prepared. He knows what he's doing. He interrogates you, me. Is this right? Is that, you know, he asks very, very considered questions. And Ben Whishaw, what's, what's he like to I work with? I have no idea what Ben Whishaw does, except that he's dazzling. <laughs> Hugh, I understood the machinery. I mean, I understand that kind of light comic acting, and I understand how it can v go into tragedy. Ben was much more mysterious. He's the most adorable man and a wonderful, wonderful actor, but where it comes from, don't ask me. It was a very, very easy job. Because you make it, was, it sound like it was quite an enjoyable job to do. It was do good fun, well, yes, of course yeah. it was a good fun. Hugh is entertaining and good company and Ben is good fun and the script was great and the story was endlessly entertaining. So it was not a great struggle for me. Have there been jobs in your career yes, that were a, oh, a big had, struggle? Yes, miserable. Yes, no, I've had misery, but this was very, very enjoyable. <laughs> but I don't think you're supposed to say that. No, it's all right. We'll, we'll I suffered. Cut. I'm sure I suffered for my heart. The time that you started making movies at the BBC was called the golden era uh, of drama, and then you moved into kind of British independent films and, and Hollywood and all that, and then you came back um, with a very English scandal, and you're making TV at a time that has kind of again been referred to as a golden era for, for TV drama. I, I think mean, there is better writing and possibly more interesting material in television than, on, in, I mean, than in the movies, yeah. Why do you think this shift from storytelling we've come to expect? Because from... the cinema abandoned life and television moved into the vacuum. I mean, what, you could see what it do happening. you mean by that? Well, the, uh, the films I make are more or less about rather odd bits of life. Once you stop making films about life, once you only make films about comic books or whatever it is, there's a whole subject you've left behind. I mean, the American cinema did it. I learnt what I know about America largely from the movies, but then they stopped making those sort of films. You've said that you rely on your crew hugely and that crew, crew's a massive part of kind of bringing production together and... Well, one of the things you do is you do less and less. 
People then say, well, what bit do you do? And I say, well, I did the thinking, which I, I think is probably quite an accurate description. Crews are now phenomenal. The level of talent is very, very high. I tend to make films about things I know nothing about. Uh, so when I made Liaison, I knew nothing about France. And, I mean, I, I could understand the humanity of the story, and I, but I knew nothing about Chateau or 18th century balance or anything like that. So everything had to be taught me, and I remember the designer coming in explaining how you should make the film visually. We had a brilliant costume design. I mean, everything was explained to me, and eventually I thought, well, I'll do the bits I can do, which actually was the casting. I'll do, it, I'll do those bits, and other people can do those bits. And I allow other people to fill the gap, because how else will you fill it? In other words, you stop pretending that you're Stanley Kubrick after a time. You stop pretending you know things you don't know. You stop fibbing. So I learned to trust people and to enjoy what they were bringing to it. You like learning and I suppose you enjoy the not yeah. knowing. So in that the sense, beginning. the whole thing has been a sort of educational course for me. So you learn the whole time what it is you're doing. I find that rather interesting. With so many movies and achievements in your career, how do you keep your passion for I find the material, film going? because the material interests me. I remember when I got the script of My Beautiful Laundrette. I remember when I got a script for The Snapper. I remember when I got Peter Morgan's script for The Deal. You know, it's just fantastic. It's like taking drugs. <laughs> uh, your work is very varied, but do you have any advice, I suppose, for young directors who are just breaking into this industry? What, what, what would you say to them? Take any job that you're offered. You have to work. The only way you learn is by doing it. Sandy McKendrick said, film direction can't be taught, it can only be learned, which is a very wise, it's so direct. Well, welcome to BAFTA. Good to be here again. Good. Now, we're obviously, life and pictures, we're just going to go right the way through the life. So, born in Tennessee, but yes. then moved with your mother to California. Mm -hmm. And age two. Age two. Um, did you get most of your early film watching through television or in theatres? It was a pretty good mix. I mean, I'm sure I saw uh, tons of stuff on television, but um, my mom was really, really young, and uh, my, uh, my parents were really young, so, you know, movies were about the only thing that they could afford to do. And they, even before they could afford to take a babysitter, hire a babysitter, it was either cheaper to just take me. So, uh, and, I, and uh, as opposed to uh, in England, uh, you're not restricted to stuff. You have, you can go see movies like R-rated movies and uh, restricted films if your parents take you to see them. And they never um, uh, um, qualified what I could see. You know, they just figured there was nothing in the movie that would ever bother me. So, what, at a very, very young age, I was like seeing The Wild Bunch and Deliverance and all these, uh, all these things. And uh, so I was just always seeing adult and, and uh, adult kind of entertainment. But I also watched all kinds of classic movies on television. <laughs> And did you think way early on that you actually would quite like to do it yourself? As a child, if you watch movies and you, and you like them and you want to be a part of them, then you think about the acting, because that's all you really know about is the actors. So you see those are the people that you see. So they're the ones doing what you want to do. If you want to be involved in movies, then you, naturally you want to be an actor. And um, I even remember um, at a very, very young age, my mom like telling her friends when they'd be over at the house, oh, Quinn is going to be a director one of these days. And I go, no, I don't want to be a director. I want to be, I didn't even know what a director was. You know? <laughs> I, 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 want to be a, I want to be an actor. And, um, but then pretty quickly as a little kid, uh, even, even and still as the young, I started, knowing who a, I started knowing who everybody was. I would go see a movie, and I, I was horrible in school and couldn't do anything in school. But I'd go see a movie, and I knew every actor in it. I knew the name of the director. I knew the name of the producer and the writer. And, and uh, I just started getting an encyclopedic knowledge about that stuff. So you had that knowledge, but you decided you didn't want to do too much school after about 16. Or yeah, so yeah. Well. Oh, no, I, quit, I definitely quit school. Well, I, school was horrible for me. It was... The worst institution ever imposed on me. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, to me, school was prison. I hated school. So you jumped out of prison and mm -hmm. you did a number of jobs, including famously working in a porn cinema. Yes, I did. Yeah, that was actually the first real job job I ever got. At, at, at age 16, I got a, a, a job as a, a usher at the Pussycat Theater, <laughs> which was a, a porno cinema. I mean, full on, triple X porn. <laughs> But in, in some ways, the, the really important job after that was a little bit later when you went to Video Archives. Terrific, yes. The video true. store. Yeah, they had a fantastic collection of movies. So I had for five years, 
the greatest collection of movies you could ever have, literally at my disposal to watch all the time. And at the same time, you were also developing your own screenplay yeah, and yeah. making your own film over quite a long period, about four or five years. Is that yeah, right? yeah. I started shooting a, a short film. I actually was uh, by a, a filmmaker that I had met along the way named Fred Olin Ray. Let me borrow a 16 millimeter camera, and I started making a short film. And then I said, after shooting that for a little while, I go, wait a minute. Um, Let's make a feature. Let's just try and expand it into a feature. So we, you know, so that started this process of a movie called My Best Friend's Birthday, and um, and I proceeded to work on that movie for about three years, basically financing it completely myself from a minimum wage job. So we would shoot, and then I'd, and that would be it, and I'd run out of money. I'd raise a couple more hundred dollars, and we'd do it again. Um, that drug on for about like three years. And were you happy with it? Well, I started putting it together and um, kind of realized I didn't have what I thought I had. And so what happened was with this, I was, oh my God, this was just all for nothing. And I'm kind of going to be a laughing stock. I got nothing to show for all this work. However, the stuff I did in the first, say, year and a half or two years, well, that was the really student filmy amateur stuff. But the stuff I had done in the last year of shooting, that wasn't bad. It was, it was pretty good. There was a genuine, definite progression. And so I looked at it as like, well, OK, look, that was my film school. I didn't know how to make a movie before I did this. And now I did this. And now I, I do know how to make a movie. And it was my film school. And it was a pretty goddamn cheap film school. And to this day, I actually think that other than the film history aspect, of, of, of film schools, that rather than go to film school, just get a camera and try to start making a movie. Now, what you also learned by the time you got to Reservoir Dogs was that actually it was very useful also to have people who could help you. I mean, Monty Hillman, for example. Yeah, Monty Hillman helped me out a lot. Director of Tulane Blacktop. Yeah. Yeah, he helped, didn't he? And then you got Harvey Keitel interested yeah. in the script. Now, how did exactly. that happen? We had Monty Hillman, and then we had uh, 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 my producer on the film, Lawrence Bender, who did ba Bastards as well. and. Um, and he goes, OK, Quentin, as far as Mr. White's concerned, who would be your dream, dream actor to play the role? And Harvey Cattell was like my favorite actor. So I was like, Harvey Cattell, that totally would be my dream. Well, it just so happened that Lawrence didn't know Harvey, but Lawrence was going to an acting class. And his teacher's wife was uh, a student at the actor studio. So it was a situation where we sent it to his teacher. His teacher read it and liked it, passed it on to his wife. His wife read it and liked it, and then passed it on to Harvey. And she actually even said to Harvey, she said, look, I, don't, I feel weird doing this, but I really think this is a really special piece of material, and I think I owe it to you to, to pass it on to you. And then the next thing we knew, Harvey called us up on the phone. He loved it. Not only did he want to do it, he wanted to help us get it made. He goes, I've never done this before, but I'd like to just be one of the producers on the film. And it was, it, was, it was like a dream come true. It was, just, it was just wonderful. But do you see how precarious all that was? As bad luck as I had seemed like I had had and everything leading up to this moment was as good as my luck was on Reservoir Dogs. Of course, what happens quite soon after this, this does very well, Reservoir Dogs, everybody loves Reservoir Dogs. Yeah. Um, then Natural Born Killers, mm -hmm. your next script, yeah. um, is made by Oliver Stone. Right. But by the time it's made, you are credited with story rather than script. Yeah. So what did you think of the finished? Well, I've never thing. seen the finished movie, Nat mm -hmm. Natural Born Killers. See, I would have actually got first credit position on Natural Born Killers if I had allowed it. But I was so pissed off that they rewrote my work. I believe in integrity, and I did not want my, I didn't care about the, the residuals or any of that stuff. God forbid anyone thought that that was my screenplay. And you feel you made that clear, that, that was absolutely Well, and then not only that, oh, I attacked Oliver Stone in the press. How dare you rewrite my shit? Well, that's standard Hollywood practice. F Hollywood practice. You don't do that to me. You know? Um, and I, but the whole point, you know, we've actually made it up since then, but the whole point, though. <laughs> that must have been a conversation. <laughs> no, it, it went a long time. It went for a long time, all right? We got drunk together, and it was fine, all right? Um, but, uh, you know, but the point, I wanted all of Hollywood to know, do not buy Quentin's script unless you're going to do it. <laughs> if you bring another writer, I'm going to attack you. <laughs> So you went to, to write Pulp Fiction, you went to Amsterdam. Yeah, I started over there, yeah. Uh -huh. So what kind of research were you doing in Amsterdam? Well, I wasn't so much doing... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
It wasn't so much I was doing research. I was, uh, I had never been anywhere before. I was just, you know, I, I just, it's hard to describe how broke I was through all of my 20s. I got paid $50,000 for Reservoir Dogs. So I said, well, I'm finally going to go to Europe. I've always wanted to go to Europe, and now I'm going to go. But I'm going to go for a while. And so I actually ended up getting a really cool little uh, place to stay in Amsterdam. I go, well, you know what? Let me see what it's like living in another, in an, another country. And so that's where I just started writing. So they had no connection about Amsterdam and writing. It was just a place to live while I was writing and have this really wonderful experience. But everything that's ever going on with me at whatever I'm writing will, fit, will find its way into the material. So since I was living in Amsterdam and having this brand new eye-opening experience of what it's like in Europe, I made it that that was, that was happening to Vincent at the exact same time. You know, that he had just come back from Amsterdam and they're asking him all these stupid questions about it and he's explaining it to them. Now, John Travolta, yeah. why did you decide to pick him up at that stage for Pulp Fiction? You'd been presumably in Admira when you yeah, came. Yeah. Did you see Saturday Night, well, Saturday Night Fever? I suppose you would have been yeah. a teenager. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. I was always thought he was a really terrific actor. And... Um, I always felt bad that uh, he'd kind of like fallen on hard times or kind of fallen by the wayside. And I remember um, they did a piece about him in the Los Angeles Times about, boy, whatever happened to John Travolta? And the whole thing kind of talking about his career and where he was and kind of what's happened to him now. But they interviewed Pauline Kael and they asked her, um, do you think John can ever come back? And she goes, he has to. Movies need him. <laughs> And I never forgot that. I never forgot that. And, uh, and I agreed with her. But I respected her so much that with, I felt it, and when she felt it, then I felt I had all I needed to go to any court in the land and fight for him. And, um, and literally, you know, uh, I wanted to you know, put him in the film, and, and uh, Harvey Weinstein didn't want him. No one would have wanted him. And I go, well, look, Harvey, here's the thing. I think he's a terrific actor, and I think you need to go and look at Blowout again, because I think that is a magnificent performance. And if you watch him in Blowout and you don't think he gives a terrific performance, then you should not make this movie, because we obviously do not see the same way about taste. <laughs> our, our version of good work and bad work is not the same, and, and I need to make a movie with somebody else. I go, well, okay, I guess he's serious. <laughs> and so Harvey backed down, and I was able to cast John. Now, around this time, you also uh, you have this company, Rolling Thunder, mm -hmm. starts up around then, yeah, yeah. which is to do with marketing and distribution. Now. Of older films. And the other thing was, um, you know, I was going to film festivals a lot. And when I went to film festivals, I just didn't do the stupid press. I went and saw movies. So I was seeing all these movies. And I got tired of recommending these movies to the Miramax, you know, uh, 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 the, their acquisition department. I got really annoyed of uh, recommending them to the acquisition department and them ignoring me. Oh, it's not right, it's not right, blah, blah, blah. So I went to Harvey and go, why don't you just set aside a little fun and let, give me the chance to buy films. I mean, I'm not, and, and, and my point in coming on it was, um, you're not gonna get paid a lot from me, but your film's gonna get released. You know, if, if anyone else will buy the rights to your film, then they should. <laughs> sell it to them. But if no one will buy the rights to your film and I like it, well then let's make a deal. You know, it is the reality that, um, you know, there's a lot of directors and they can be renowned and they can play at festivals, but until they finally get an American commercial theatrical release, they're not like officially on the map. It's not just playing at a film festival, it's actually getting a full theatrical release. And if it's actually being picked up and being shown in America, then they're saying it's one of 50. It's one of 80. It's not just a good movie. It actually deserves a screen and deserves to have a chance for people paying to see it. <laughs>